You're good to go. Okay. <clears throat> hello, hello. Hello. Can I grab some seats, please? Good evening. I want to say uh, welcome to everybody, especially anybody who's never been to Etsy before. Anybody who's first time? Um, Awesome, awesome. So tonight's talk is part of our Coda's Craft series where we bring in speakers from um, different areas that are, uh, all contribute to software engineering and product development. Um, tonight, obviously, we have Rasmus Lerdor speaking. Uh, Rasmus has worked as a, uh, a technical advisor for Etsy for, for a couple of years, I guess. Um, we're pretty big users of PHP. We've got a couple of people around who are wearing orange Etsy stickers, so if you want to hear what we're doing, um, you can grab any of them. Uh, Rasmus gave a talk uh, to uh, end of 2009, which actually was the, the interesting point of this story is that that was the first time I came to the Etsy offices. And, and Chad Dickerson, who's our CEO now, um, grabbed me while I was in the office and said, hey, things are kind of interesting around here. I'd really like to talk to you about it. So watch out for that guy. Don't let that happen to you. Um, What's that? Still interesting, he says. After, yeah, after all those two years. Um, so yes, uh, tonight Rasmus is going to be talking a little bit about the state of PHP in, in 2012 and what's new in uh, 5.4. So please help me give a very warm welcome to Rasmus Lerdorf. Thank you. And thank you to Etsy for inviting me. Although they are making me work hard this week. <laughs> um, the slides are online if you want to follow along or check back on some of the examples later on. This stuff all started for me in 1993 when I saw Mosaic. First graphical web browser, first time I could explain to my mother what it was I sat and hacked on. I had worked on Gopher, um, some IRC stuff before then but nothing that I could explain to my mother in any way whatsoever, right? With a graphical web browser, everyone knew this was, this was gonna take off. So the web in 1993 looked like this. You'd have mostly all caps HTML tags and this bogus CGI bin Perl counter thrown in that showed how many times this page had been hit, which meant nothing to anybody. can accept the web server process, then you have to fire up Perl just to create this little image, and it just completely toasted servers. So I needed a smarter way of solving the web problem than CGI bin Perl. I looked at embedding Perl into the web server itself, but it was too damn complicated, and I didn't need a language. I just needed a t templating system, a little macro system that I could link to my C code because you'd have to be a complete idiot to write web applications in an untyped, non-compiled <laughs> language. So, and I wasn't a complete idiot, so. I built this little macro templating system that basically just let me put HTML comment tags into my HTML, very much along the lines of SSI. If you run across SSI, server-side includes were kind of a big thing back then, but they were very limited what you could do. You couldn't do SQL queries, you couldn't do any of these things. So PHP version one was basically just a really powerful SSI implementation that I hacked into the NCSA and the CERN web servers. So to use it effectively, you'd have to download my web server, which was a little bit tricky for people. They weren't quite sure that they wanted to download my version of the CERN web server versus the CERN version of the web server. So things didn't really start taking off until Apache came out later on. Apache was built from a bunch of patches to the NCSA web server, hence the name. And one of the things that came in early in Apache was a module API, a way of extending Apache and adding modules to it. And I was involved with the Apache project back then, and PHP was one of the first real powerful modules for, for Apache. And along with building the module version of PHP, I also read a book on how to actually build a parser because I had no idea. I was just building web apps. I wasn't worried about building a language or building um, 
an, an actual parser. I just needed to, to get at my C code in an effective way. But it got to be a bit of a hassle to always be inside HTML common tag. So I wanted to be able to put multiple statements inside one of these things. And the common tag didn't seem to fit that well. So I read another spec, the SGML spec, which is where HTML comes from, or it used to come from there. Now it's sort of a hybrid thing that I don't quite understand anymore. But it used to be uh, a DTD of, of SGML. And in the SGML spec, there's a PI tag, a process instruction tag, which is the bracket question mark. So I grabbed that and said, hey, I'm processing instructions inside an HTML doc. This is going to be the PHP tag. The spec did say you're supposed to name your tags. So you're supposed to say this, the, this is a PHP instruction. So it should be bracket question mark PHP. But since nobody else was using the PI tag, I said, ah, screw it. I'll just <laughs> use it. And, and then later on, many years later, the XML guys came along and complained. Parser, so they eventually convinced us to change it to bracket question mark PHP. I still prefer the short tags, though. I mean, I was there first. It's my tag, damn it. <laughs> um, but other than that, I mean, this was PHP in 1995. It doesn't look that different. It didn't have curly braces. Actually, to be completely honest, it didn't have while loops either. It only had for loops. Um, but we had for, end, for, while, end, while, things like that. I didn't have a question mark on the closing tag back then, which was another misread of the spec. I'm pretty bad at that. I read like the first half of specs, and then I get bored, fall asleep. Um, but it worked pretty well. Now, if we fast forward 10 years, this same piece of code would be written and to look more like this. Lots of objects, um, lots of fancy stuff going on in here. I still kind of prefer this. It's, procedural, it's straightforward, I can read it. It's not very complicated. Um, but PHP was never about religion. It was never about changing the way you solve problems. It was about giving you a hammer. And a hammer that has sort of all the characteristics of, of what a hammer should be as far as you're concerned. When we built PHP, when I built PHP way back when, people came to this with a little bit of a C, a little bit of Perl background usually. So that's what I emulated. I took stuff from Perl, stuff from C, um, but the world has moved on from 1995, obviously, and now kids are coming out of university who have never done any procedural programming. They've done nothing but Java and some C++ sometimes if they're lucky, um, but they don't even know what procedural programming is, some of them, which is very confusing to me. So anyway, we now have objects, but one of the reasons that I think PHP did so well was exactly because I didn't focus that much on the language. I was very focused on sort of the ecosystem around PHP from the very beginning. It was always about speeding up the final solution. It was about taking the old CERN and NCSA web servers and embedding stuff into it. So thinking about where's this thing going to run? How is it going to run? How can I get from the request to the response as quickly as possible? The actual syntax of the language and things were pretty much secondary to getting a solid ecosystem. And as the web grew, that kind of kept um, being a sort of a, a motivating or driving force behind PHP. It was about how are people going to get at PHP? And in the early days of the web, everyone was on virtual shared hosts, right? So they didn't have their own IP or anything. They were just sharing a host with a thousand of their closest friends. And they all had to coexist on a single Apache server for the most part. And ISPs that were putting up stuff like that, they needed some sort of help with separating users and not having one user take down the entire web server so nobody else could serve their pages. And for that, we had stuff like max memory limit. Um, we had timeouts and things that, you, that the ISP could configure. So even if someone wrote just a recursive bomb of a script, or a while true type of script, it wouldn't take down the server. And we also didn't let people hook into parts of the Apache web server that could change sort of the nature of the server, like Mod Perl allows, for example. You can completely change everything about an Apache web server through Mod Perl, which is really cool, but it sucks for ISPs. 
because you cannot have one mod pro user sitting next to another mod pro user without them stepping on each other. So ISPs loved the fact that PHP was pretty easy to sort of put in one box for one user, another box for another user, and for the most part, they didn't interfere. Very easy to learn, and it scales as well, right? So it didn't try to be an application server. It tried to sort of just sit along with the architecture of the web. So the web doesn't carry a state unless you add a state, right? The request comes across, you process something, you give a response back, and that's it. There's no state unless you set a session cookie or something. And PHP doesn't keep any sort of server-side state. We, keep, we have this thing called a perfect sandbox. So anything that we do in one request, we tear down at the end of the request. And that means that you can very, very easily scale horizontally because anything that doesn't scale is stuff that you added that doesn't scale. The environment itself is perfectly scalable. So you don't read a lot about scaling PHP, like you read about scaling Java, right? Because, and also um, ASP stuff, where you have application variables, right? Where you can just stick stuff in the JVM, you can stick stuff in IIS memory on that particular server. It doesn't help you very much if the next request gets load balanced to a different server or even a different data center, right? Then you have to start worrying about, well, how do I do intro JVM communications or intro IIS communications to share this state across? And that starts getting complicated. So I always avoided that. I said, look, there are other things out there that can manage shared state. You can install MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, Memcache came along that focused on that particular problem. So I think that helped PHP quite a bit. So the other thing that really helped PHP was that you could do crazy stuff in like one line of code. As APIs started to improve, where are my images? My images got lost. Um, but in like a single line of code, you can hit a Flickr RSS feed, for example. This is the RSS feed of just uploaded photos. And by having a very solid XML parser built right in that you could just feed a URL to in a single line of code, you can walk through an RSS feed and pick out all these photos. Oh, I am not, sorry. Yeah, it's because I'm not on the, on the network. Go. Do we have the same network up here? Up downstairs, okay. There we go, now I'm on, hold on, sorry about that. Okay, I didn't know this, I wasn't there. So another little one, hit, hitting the Flickr API, couple of lines of code, you can pull in interesting photos from around Brooklyn, right? And now with CSS coming along, which we didn't have in 1995, but you could take this exact same thing, add about 20 lines of CSS, and you can make it look like this instead, right? Nice pile of photos, you can put rounded corners on divs, you can rotate divs. So any kid can sit down and in a weekend can build visually stunning things that talks to APIs all around the web that does really, really cool things. And you don't have to know a lot about this stuff. So one of the other driving factors of PHP has always been sort of presenting rather complicated things like databases and APIs in a way that's very accessible to people with very little experience in this stuff. The people with the actual good ideas, right? If the whole web was only built by CS students, it would suck, it would be terrible. <laughs> right? I mean, you need people with some creativity, with some other references, right? With some other backgrounds to get in there and, and, and help make the web dynamic. And APIs have really gotten interesting. Um, there's a Yahoo API called YQL, which is kind of like select star from the web. It wraps every API out there. And there's stuff in there like analyzing names. So you can do a select star from, uh, select star from first names lookup, where name equals Rasmus in this case. And it tells you that it's a Frisian Scandinavian type of name, right? Um, we can put Chad in here. Let's see, it's an American first name, right? It tells you it's male, but if you had to do that yourself to analyze, is this user male or female? Where is, where is this user from? 
it's really cool that in a single line of code you can basically pull down information like that. And same with weather information. Select star from weather underground forecast where location equals Brooklyn. And now you have the weather forecast very, very easily. So as these little puzzle pieces start becoming just sort of click, 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 you can start forgetting about the problem of, of, of how your hammer is going to sort of, how, how are you going to use the hammer? It's more about what are you going to use the hammer for? What are we actually going to build? Because the technology isn't that hard. Now you do hit some obstacles once you get big, once you start growing at the speed Etsy is growing, for example, you start hitting some growing pains, but not to the point where you have to completely throw away the hammer. The PHP scales down really, really well to the weekend warrior that knows very little, but it also handles sites like Facebook and Yahoo and Etsy now on, on the higher end of scalability. It doesn't make it trivial to build a site with PHP at that scale, but it doesn't make it impossible either. And building something that can handle a Facebook and a weekend warrior in the same code base is pretty tricky. And a lot of the complaints about PHP kind of center around that, that it's not focused on a particular experience level. The CS purists, for example, hate PHP because there are a lot of shortcuts in PHP. The fact that we have just one array type, for example, that's not like any one particular array type um, out there. It's sort of a, a mish mishmash of different types of arrays. But at the same time, the weekend warrior doesn't want to know about 13 different data structs that kind of all do the same thing, but not quite, right? They just want to stick stuff in and get stuff back out. And for the most part, that's what PHP gives you. All right, so PHP in 2012. Some of the things I've been thinking about lately, HashDOS sucks badly. Haven't run across HashDOS, it's basically most languages out there have this problem because we all do some hashing internally. So hashing, you take, when you put stuff in an array, for example, we take the array key and we hash it to a unique um, string internally so we can very easily look it up. So when you ask for this array key next time, we hash it and we go look for this hash and we can put it back. Now, if two keys hash to the same value, we have to sort of put in the same bucket and then we have a linked list. So we have a little pointer to the next element. Now, if everything hashes to the same exact element, then we have a really long linked list that we have to jump across to find this particular element. We use a very nice hashing algorithm that's actually really good at distributing keys across the whole, across all the buckets for normal data. But you can game the hashing and you can say, you can have special key names that all are created to collide and to all hash into the same bucket. And that's what this hash does is, that you create special keys that all hash to the same bucket, and that can really slow down PHP and other languages too, Java as well, because they now have to walk linked lists every time you try to get one of these elements out of the, out of the hash, and that sucks. And you may have noticed today, there's lots of news about PHP security stuff. And our hash DOS fix from three weeks ago had a slight mistake in it, so you could actually overwrite a pointer and you could potentially uh, execute arbitrary code, all because of this stupid hash DOS problem to begin with. So I'm not a huge fan of hash DOS. Um, 5.4 is coming out soon. Once we get through some of these security issues, we will get 5.4 pushed out the door. I'm assuming in the next four to six weeks, we'll have 5.4.0, hopefully. Trying to get down to zero failed tests. We have about 13,000 tests for PHP. And in 5.3, on a typical system, we would have 200 to 300 failures if you link in a lot of extensions, which is way too many. Now in 5.4, we're down to about five to 10, depending on your environment. If you're on Windows, there are a few more. If you're on OS X, there are a few more. If you're on Linux, FreeBSD, there are a little bit less. Um, also depends on your locale sometimes. There's all kinds of little pieces that can cause a test to fail on one system and not on the other. And we're trying to improve our tests. Gearman has been a source of pain for a lot of startups that I've visited in the past year. And we need better Gearman worker management. It's a very geeky project that I'm trying to get someone at Etsy to attack. Um, SVM is kind of cool. We have an SVM extension in PHP. Now, we've had it for a few years, actually, but people are just starting to notice it now. 
If you haven't heard of SVM, um, SVM is a um, sort of stats related thing. It stands for support vector machine. So a support vector machine is basically a way of categorizing data. So you can, it's, it's a form of machine learning. You can feed it a whole bunch of data and you can say all this data with these vectors map to this area of, of, or map, map to this bucket. All these vectors cause it to go in this bucket. Terrible explanation, but it's all about hyperplanes and things and it's really cool. So it's a way of doing machine learning and saying, okay, here's a bunch of stuff. Um, all these transactions are good that have these characteristics. All these transactions are bad. And once you've taught the SVM machine that, then next time you get another transaction and you feed it these various vectors in, you say, okay, the person logged in from New York, but his credit card is registered in, in, in Massachusetts. And all these vectors will go in and the thing that, that SVM can then categorize that <laughs> transaction and say, this is probably fraud or this is not fraud, depending on which bucket it falls in. And all that's kind of built in. All you do is you feed it arrays to teach it. And then, again, a weekend warrior can build a nice SVM categorizer in a weekend with this extension, which is really cool. LibEvent, you can build very nice event-driven apps in PHP, which people don't seem to realize. A lot of Node folks are really happy about the Node asynchronous approach. You can actually do something very similar in PHP. Um, and you don't have to do a turn-based thing. You, you can do it, if you know LibEvent at the C level, you can approach it very much the same way in PHP. Zero MQ is one of my favorite libraries out there these days as well. Zero MQ, despite the MQ, it's not really message queuing. There's no server part of it. It's kind of like SQLite is to databases, right? SQLite is not a real database. SQLite is a database-like front end to files. It's really cool. You can select star from, from a text file, essentially. It's really nice. It's a very good paradigm for dealing with text files. You should never write a flat text file parser again. If you're ever looking at doing that, use SQLite. And SQLite is built into Mozilla and all kinds of things, right? It's, it's everywhere these days. I think 0MQ is going to be everywhere as well because it is a library that sits on top of sockets and it makes socket manip manipulation super, super simple. So one-to-one, one-to-many, many-to-many, pub-sub-hub type stuff, all that stuff becomes very, very simple with 0MQ. Combine it with, lib, uh, with uh, lib event, and you can build some really nifty things. And my last point on here is I should actually get a job at some point. Although I did convince my wife to get a job now, so. Maybe I don't need to. <laughs> she starts on Monday. We'll see. <laughs> so here's a little example where I took libevent and 0MQ and mashed them together. So this is rather geeky. A little bit of a code example here. If you know libevent, you, this should look familiar to you. When I'm setting up event base, event new, um, basically binding to localhost 5555. So I've created a little server here that sits in this event loop and just um, calls a callback. And my callback just increments a counter. So I have a static variable here, messages. And every time an event comes in, it's going to say, um, got incoming data. And it's going to increment the counter and send that counter back. So first demo in the world doesn't look very interesting at all, but I can start my, I'll start my server over here. So my server is running. It gets a callback right on start for some reason. Um, it's deep in zero MQ. They're going to fix it, they told me. Um, and now every time I run the client, you can see I get a got message one, two, three. Oh, it's hard to read, isn't it? Sorry about that. Um, but basically, that's all it takes to build a, a client server. So the server is about 30 lines of code maybe. The client using 0MQ is three lines of code. Right? So I connect, um, connect to my socket on 5555, create a 0MQ socket, connect it, and then I can do a Q send. So I send hello there to the socket, grab the response, and print it out. So creating sockets, sending to sockets, reading from sockets, and all kinds of 0MQ magic is extremely easy. I would love to see people doing some magical things with 0MQ and LibEvent. All right. 
Let's talk a bit about performance. Please fix your errors, your warnings, your notices. Set error reporting to minus one. Error reporting is a bit field, so setting it to minus one turns everything on. So in development, please fix all your warnings and notices. It can take a little while to deal with a notice, even if you're not logging it, especially if you have an error handler, like a custom error handler installed. The custom error handler is gonna get called for each one of these. Even if you do nothing with it, it's an extra user space function call that hurts a bit performance wise. Use strace, you don't have any idea of why this thing is slow, what's it doing, why is it not working. I find a lot of people don't know about strace. So strace lets you trace system calls. You use strace, the name of the command, and you can see all the system calls that a program is doing. So you can see how a program affects the system. Very nice thing to, to do. So here I was strating, strating some smarty stuff a while back and seeing that it was looking for uh, an NL2BR modifier for Smarty, even though there's an NL2BR function built into PHP. It went hunting through the file system to find these things every time. These are the kind of things you don't really notice until you start looking at what is my program doing? How is it trying to talk to this file? The XH GUI on top of it. So call grind lets you profile at the system level. A little bit like strace, but with a much nicer granularity and a much nicer output in the sense that you can get pictures of how, many, how much of my CPU time is spent in this part of the code, how much of the CPU time is spent in the database, how much CPU time is spent on other things, right? I use it all the time to check my assumptions. So I have some idea in my head when I write something that, okay, this must, that the cost of this particular piece of code is about this much versus the cost of this thing is about this much. If you don't know the costs, you can't make intelligent decisions. If you're just assuming costs, you're gonna be wrong. So at some point you need to check your assumptions and make sure that you're not spending 90% of your CPU time on a feature that's redundant, right? So call grind is at the system level, xdebug and xhprof can be used at the PHP level to see, okay, now that we're inside the PHP executor, where we're spending our time. So I usually do call grind first, then I do xdebug, xhprof on top after. Um, there's an extension called peckle include, spelt this way on purpose, right? That will give you a picture of includes. Another good sanity check to make sure that you don't build stuff like this, where this is index.php that includes a file, that includes three files, and this file here includes all those files, that includes that, and includes that, and it goes on to the right here, right? So, and that's one request. It's a lot of stuff to do on one request. And this is kind of an average, actually, for most of the frameworks out there. There are some frameworks that do way, way more than this. The Magento picture, for example, was huge. Uh, it would fill the entire side of the wall here if we blew it up to sort of the same size as this, and it crashes my browser if I try to show the picture. <laughs> Magento? No. Oh, include. So the name is I-N-C-L-U, as in okay. clue you in on includes. Silly name, I know. Um, hip hop. You may have read about Facebook's project to turn PHP into C++. So they basically parse PHP, spit out C++ code, and compile it with G++, which is completely nuts. But in the process of building this hip hop thing, they had to learn how to parse PHP really well. Because you turn one language into another, you really need to understand the language that you're converting, right? So they wrote this really kick-ass parser that you can use for static analysis. So you can, if you can get hip hop compiled, which is non-trivial, then you can use target equals analyze, so feed it all your PHP files and use target equals analyze and it will basically do static analysis to check for uh, dead pieces of code, for undeclared variables, for all these things. Many of the things can get caught by PHP's parser, but because PHP, it's sort of a compiler. If you call a function that doesn't exist, you get an, an error, right? But only if you actually execute code that tries to call that function. 
right? If you never execute the code that tries to call the function, you'll never see the error, which means that there may be a certain set of conditions users can do that will then try to call this function that doesn't exist that none of your test cases have seen. So static analysis is a good replacement for 100% code coverage, right? Because if you can't get anywhere near 100% code coverage in your unit tests, then you're likely to miss stuff where static analysis may be able to save you on those. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get to 100% code coverage, but it, should, it means that this is a little bit of a safety net for stupid typos and things like that that can be caught by hip hop. Some architecture reminders. I've been doing a bit of consulting with startups over the last year and a half, two years, and I see some recurring problems. One of the big ones is the first thing there, that people are not using a separate subdomain for their static assets. Um, there are two big reasons for doing it. First is you may want to CDN your static assets at some point. CDN is a content distribution network, like Akamai and um, Amazon has one as well now. Meaning that you want to put your images, your CSS, your JavaScript perhaps closer to the users. So CDNs maintain these peers and data centers that are closer to the end users. And they do some DNS tricks to make this content load faster and also offload your servers. Now, if you have to go and change all your HTML to point to a different domain for this, it's going to be a pain, right? So if you can simply just do a DNS switch when you want to switch to a CDN, that helps a lot. But the bigger reason is that if you put static stuff on the same URL as your main website, you're probably using some session cookies and things. It means that every request for an image or a CSS file or a JavaScript file will also get a cookie sent, which slows things down a little bit for normal browsers, but it can slow things down a lot for mobile browsers, especially considering the MTU. Typical MTU, the maximum transmission unit on a TCP connection is like 1460, 1440, depending on where you are. It's really easy for a web request with a big cookie to overflow a single MTU. And sometimes you only overflow it by five or six bytes. But if you do overflow it, it means that the web server can't set, start sending the response until there's an ACK that goes back to the browser that says, okay, I got that first packet, send me the next packet. So you have to wait for another TCP packet to arrive at the server before you can start processing the request and sending back. And sometimes simply putting all your static assets on a cookie-less domain makes sure that you stay within a single MTU and that can speed up mobile clients a lot. Don't put too much stuff on a single web server. Your, your site is getting busier and busier. The answer isn't just to crank up the concurrent um, processes on your server, like from 20 to 40, 40 to 200, right? It's like, okay, we need to go faster. Let's run more Apache processes or let's run more PHP FPM workers, right? The answer there is to keep them nice and small, four, five, six times the number of cores on your machine, depending on your memory as well. It, it's a bit of tricky tuning to get the exact right number, but at a certain point, you don't want to put more load on the server. You want to get requests in and out as fast as possible. You don't want them piling up in the queue. So at a certain point, you have to add servers next to it and to scale horizontally. Please, 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 don't move relational data out of relational databases. I know NoSQL is really cool. Couch, um, all these guys, they're very, very nice. But trying to add relations back on top of, no, of a NoSQL database is just painful. And it'll never work. Postgres is really good. Use it. Out of band processing. A lot of people ask me for threading in PHP because they want to do multiple things at the same time. It's completely the wrong answer to that. If you want to do stuff out of band, you want to kick off some job to do something, the last thing you want is your web server to get overloaded with more stuff to do. You really want to send that job off to some worker somewhere that's going to maybe connect to 10 hosts out there and download RSS feeds or do DNS lookups or, or who knows what it is you want to do in parallel, but send it off to a worker to do that. You can then check the status of it later. Um, the answer isn't to open a separate thread on the front end web servers. That's really a bad idea. The front end web server's role is to get a request and get a response back to the user as fast as humanly possible, right? You don't want to slow that down in any way. 
Um, foreign keys, I've seen a couple of small startups completely lock up their website with foreign keys that kind of went like this and are waiting on each other. Be very, very careful with foreign keys, especially foreign keys hidden, be hidden behind ORM stuff where the programmers have no idea what their code actually is doing to the database. And then once you fall into this ORM trap, then you start realizing that, well, this is really slow. There are way too many requests going to the database. We better cache, right? We better put a cache in between our ORM and the database so we don't kill the crap out of our database. And caching is really, really easy. Just write everything to a cache. The hard thing about caching is invalidating the damn entries because you didn't change something some, somewhere, right? But then people go hit your site and you don't see the change because they're all reading from the cache. Right? So you, when you change something, you have to go around and figure out all the cache entries where this might need to be invalidated. And you have tricky joins and foreign keys and all these things. This one piece of data could end up in hundreds of cache entries. Right? And tracking that down and trying to un unwind your ORM cache is a real pain. And every single startup I have seen in the last two years had pains regarding their ORM cache. Etsy included. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, yeah, you, you have absolutely no problems with your ORM cache, yeah? I'm wrong. <laughs> um, all right, and finally, if you're not on 5.3, what the hell are you doing? Get on 5.3, please. Etsy's even on 5.3, so hey, you have no excuse. Let's, just a quick overview of why you should be on 5.3. We have sped things up quite a bit. We're using the stack more effectively internally. Constants now end up in read-only memory. Exception handling is faster. Um, Windows is way faster. Not that most people care. MD5 is faster. Again, you shouldn't care that much about MD5 being faster. But overall, you should expect to see between 5 and 15% performance improvement, depending on what you're doing. If you're on Windows, yeah, you'll get way more than that. So some of the new things in 5.3, closures. So the traditional closure usage, you can now pass, you can do a anonymous function, pass it directly to a use sort there, for example, as opposed to having to define the function and pass it your, your sort function. So that's just a simple little function that sorts the even numbers before the odd numbers, as you can see. You can also nest them. So you can put one closure inside another, and you can use, um, use variables from the outer scope by using the use statement. You can get trickier. Um, you do have to keep in mind that closures are early binding in the sense that when you do a use, it will use the value of that variable at the point of closure definition. So when you define the closure and you do a use, we take the value of the variable at that point. So in this case, this function here that's creating the closure is looking at the global message variable. So I set the message variable to hello. I get my closure, call my closure, I see hello. If I then set my message variable to world, call my closure again, it still says hello, right? Because it's not late binding. Now, you can make it late binding if you like, simply by adding this here. So you're adding a reference to the message variable, right? So now you get what you might expect. Now, some people are saying, well, why isn't it always late binding? Well, because it would be really hard to make it early binding for the times where you do actually want it early binding. But we have this perfectly natural way of making it late binding by using a reference. Namespaces are new in 5.3 as well. Nothing really that complicated about them. The only thing people find complicated is the separator, it's a backslash. The reason it's a backslash is because it was the only single character token left in the grammar that didn't conflict. <laughs> you find it funny, but I mean, it's kind of important. I mean, namespace is all about shortening symbols and then categorizing and stuff. If we had to have a three letter operator, it kind of defeats the purpose. And it kind of looks like a Windows directory separator, which is kind of like namespaces in a sense, right? I don't think it's such a big stretch, but people really, really don't like it. Tough, get used to it. It's not that bad. <laughs> so 5.3 also introduced late static binding. 
So late static binding is a slight change on how much control you have over how objects are built in PHP. Previously, we would just do all the inheritance and shove everything into a final object, and you didn't have any insight into where a method, a final method in your object, where it actually came from. What's, what's the original class that it came from? You didn't have any idea about that in, in versions previous to 5.3. Now you have some idea. You can do uh, reflection, and you can also do things like calling um, the function within the class that was a, it was defined in, um, and you can walk around the different methods of different classes in the final object. So you can do some very, very interesting things with, with LSP. There's also a get call class, so you can see which class is actually called with, within the object. But it's kind of low-level geeky object stuff. If you want to read more, go to php.net slash LSP on that one. We added a garbage collector. Um, PHP is reference counted. So when the reference, number of references to a variable hits zero, so if you do $A equals one, um, and then you set $A to some other variable, or you say $A equals $B, then the reference count on that bucket that contains the one drops to zero, and that bucket gets erased. Now, because of references, um, you can set multiple references to the same one. You can say $A equals one, $B equals a reference to $A, $C equals a reference to $A. You now have three variables pointing to that bucket containing the one. You can reassign A, but that doesn't erase the one in memory because you still have B and C pointing to it. And that's sort of straightforward reference counting. It gets complicated once you have cyclical references. Once you have A pointing to B, pointing to C, pointing to D, pointing back to A, it gets hard for a reference counted memory manager to keep track of that. And that's when you need um, a garbage collector to try to unwind some of these cyclic references. For the most part in the web request, you should never need it unless you're doing fractals or anything highly recursive like that in your web. The other time you might need it is if you're writing daemons. So long running scripts, if you're writing a web server in PHP, first you're an idiot, but this, <laughs> this will help you have this thing not chew up memory on you over time. Honestly, I turn it off in all my stuff because it can slow you down a little bit. Um, it shouldn't really affect normal web requests, but there are times when it can. You can also turn it on and off, sort of specifically for blocks of code. So you can say GC enable and you can turn it back off and GC disable just for certain blocks. A much simpler feature is NowDoc. Most of you probably have seen HereDoc, right? With a triple less than a token, and then you can put a string, we can put a bunch of text with dollar variables in there and um, escape sequences and stuff, slash n slash t, and all that gets expanded. If you put single quotes around your token, it becomes just like a single quoted string in PHP. Right? Inside a single quoted string, we don't expand variables, we don't ex expand escape sequences, but you can now do that sort of in line using this now doc syntax. Goto, another nicely controversial feature. <laughs> Who here hates Goto? Okay, not that many people actually. Nice. Um, it's it's not it's not an unrestricted Goto. Unrestricted Gotos are evil. It's a restricted Goto in the sense that you can only jump out of blocks or within the same block. So you can't jump into the middle of a function, for example. You'll get a compiler error if you try. And we have. We basically had go to forever in PHP because we've always had multi-level breaks, multi-level continue. You could always say break two, right? Continue three, that's a go to, right? So when people say they hate go to, but they don't mind multi-level breaks, well, it's kind of ridiculous because it's exactly the same thing. And I much prefer a go to in code like this because here, what would you have? Break three, they all know, wait, that's an if, that doesn't count, it's a break two. And then you see break two, it's like, where does that end up? One, two, oh no, wait, that's an if, no, it's there, right? With a go-to, it's immediately obvious what's happening. And it's exactly the same thing. So, nothing evil about go-to as far as I'm concerned. As long as they're restricted go-tos like this. <clears throat> we have a ternary shortcut. You can leave out the true expression. If you leave out the true expression of the ternary, it'll use the conditional expression value um, as the true value. So you can just do bracket colon or question mark colon and 
the true value ends up being returned in this particular case. So you see the one. And echo false, shortcut world, you end up getting world back, right? We've added dir. You'll see in PHP code everywhere, you'll see dir name file, just to get the directory of the current file, right? It's an extra user space call that we don't really need. So we've just added dir that does the same thing. So you can go through, you can do a search and replace for dir name file all over your code and replace it with underscore underscore dir and you'll save a little bit of time. Not much, but slightly cleaner. Call static, exactly the same as call in previous versions, but now you can use it for static methods. So you can call a static method in an object that doesn't exist, in a class that doesn't exist. If you have a call static defined, it'll do the same thing as underscore underscore call, and let you call it. Dynamic static calls are allowed now, which doesn't seem like it make, makes much sense, right? Dynamic static calls, what the hell? Um, what it means is that you can create, the name of your static function can be dynamically defined. That didn't used to work, where you can say, I want to call a function named foo here. You'd have to hard code foo for a static call before. This was just sort of a, a miss in the parser that we hadn't gotten around to. We have some pretty cool date manipulation stuff in 5.3, where you can say, um, you can create an interval, for example, from a beginning um, date to an end date, and you can set the interval that iterates from the current date to the next date. And this iterator here is a third Tuesday of next month iterator. So when you go from one, from the beginning to the end, using this iterator, you basically get all the third Tuesdays within that range. In this case, I'm doing it for uh, 2010, it looks like. So these are all the third Tuesdays of the month of 2010. And that gets kind of complicated with sort of normal coding, trying to figure out the third Tuesday and watching out for leap years and all that crap, right? Also because humans are stupid, we came up with date formats that are not parsable, right? Like 080107. The hell is that? <laughs> right? And I mostly blame Americans for messing up the order. I mean, you either go least significant to most or most to least, but why would you go month, day, year? That makes absolutely no sense. So now with the, you can now help it along a little bit. You can say, I know it's in this format. You can do a date create from format and with a format helper. You also can get some sense of if you can't parse a date, which does happen occasionally, you can now get a better error message saying, I was able to go up five characters, but then I got confused because I don't understand November 33rd, right? So you get some hint in the error message what went wrong. SPL has some new stuff. Um, we have a glob iterator now. So you can say glob iterator, you can get all the star.log files very easily, for example. And we also have some new um, SPL data structures. So you can do a stack. So here as you pop things onto the stack, they'll come back out in last in, first out order, like a normal stack. You can do a max heap. So as you insert stuff onto the heap, it'll keep it sorted highest to lowest all the time. You can also, there's also a min heap, obviously. You can do priority queues, where you can set priorities of things that you're inserting into your queues, and they'll come back out in the right order when you iterate over it and print them out. FPM is one of the big new features in 5.3. Basically, FPM is a fast CGI process manager, and most people are using it with Nginx. So it's a very nice, alternative to Apache and Mod PHP running Nginx with PHP FPM. So FPM takes all the process management in Apache that manages keeping Apache worker processes running and if one dies off, starting a new one, all that stuff that's built into Apache that you get for free is now built directly into <coughs> PHP. So you can basically tell PHP, start 10 PHP FPM workers, keep them running, and you configure Nginx to send fast CGI requests, usually to like localhost port 8000 or something, whatever you configure it to do. And you configure PHP FPM to listen to that socket. And it works extremely well. Now to go along with that, when you 
move away from Apache, you lose things like HT access and being able to define INI directives on a per host or per directory basis. So we, did, we implemented that as well. So in your INI file, you can say, for this particular path, set these INI settings, and for this particular host, set these things. You can also have the equivalent of an HT access file um, called user INI, or you can call it whatever you want, but the default is .user INI, and we have a TTL on it. So unlike HT access, we don't hit it on every request. We cache it for a certain amount of time. But, I mean, that doesn't mean you can take your current Apache HT access files that have a bunch of mod rewrite rules in it and just make it work. There's no mod rewrite in PHP FPM. There's no mod rewrite in Nginx either. So that's where you're going to have to learn a little bit of Lua and stuff and get in and, and, and play with the Nginx configuration format to convert those over. That's usually the biggest stumbling blocks for people trying to move away from Apache onto Nginx is that they have reams of mod rewrite stuff that they really don't want to touch because it's magic. <laughs> All right, 5.4. So hopefully I convinced you there's enough cool stuff in 5.3 to get onto it. Now I'm gonna to try to convince you to help us test out 5.4. So again, we have worked quite a bit on performance. Um, fast CGI, because a lot of people have been moving to Nginx and PHP FPM, Fast CGI has gotten a lot of attention in the last year or so. So we've done lots of work on that. Gain, memory handling, startup and shutdown is slightly faster now, which usually isn't that important to web stuff, but there are times when it's interesting. Um, various other low level things. The silent operator is faster. <laughs> Hopefully you're not using it that much, but if you have to use it, it's now less of a penalty. It really was quite slow in previous versions. Um, Unserialized is faster. Empty hashes are quite a bit faster. Often you do $A equals empty array to initialize it. That was actually quite slow. Um, now that's a single op and it's, it's quite fast. We've removed a whole bunch of stuff, which may make your stuff break. So you need to <laughs> test, test, test before you go on to it, but hopefully these are things, these are mostly things that we've been saying are deprecated for years now, we're saying when we've been warning against them, there are notices against using it. So uh, finally we just said, okay, we're gonna cut some of these. We've given people like four or five years to get it out of their systems, um, but we still get lots of people complaining about the fact that <laughs> some of these things are done. <laughs> Y2K compliance, yes. Don't laugh at that's my favorite feature, man. <laughs> that saved me so much pain and suffering in 1999. Because people would always contact me and ask me, so is PHP Y2K compliant? Which is a completely ridiculous question because it's what you write with PHP. It's like asking, is my pencil Y2K compliant? Well, it depends what you write with it, right? But they don't want to hear that answer. They wanted some kind of action item. They want to go to their boss and say, I checked and I made PHP Y2K compliant. <laughs> so a Y2K compliance INI setting, all they have to do is say Y2K compliance equals true <laughs> in their PHP INI. <laughs> Win! <laughs> but it actually did do something. It was not a complete placebo, almost complete placebo. The original Netscape cookie spec was quite vague on whether to use two digit or four digit years in the cookie, in the set cookie call. Um, all the examples used two digit years, but the text describing it used four digit years. So the early browsers were all over the place in terms of whether they used two or four digit years in set cookie. So that's what this changed. So PHP set cookie call, if you had Y2K compliance on, would use four digit years in set cookie. Without it, it would use two digit years. That's all it did though. <laughs> all right. So. Probably the sort of the most talked about feature in 5.4 is traits. And traits is a little bit of a rabbit hole for people because they start thinking way, way, way too much about it. <laughs> Don't, it's just a copy and paste. It's a compiler assisted copy and paste. It happens at compile phase, not at execution phase. So by the time we've compiled the script, we've created this object or this class essentially and that has copied the trait code into the class where you have used that trait. So in this case, we can define the trait, we call it singleton. 
And this singleton trait defines a method called get instance. Yes, I know singletons is not a very proper thing to be using, but still, it kind of illustrates what you might want to do. So inside class A, I want to write class A as a singleton. And every single singleton in my app is going to need this get instance method. Now previously without traits, you might have a base class called singleton or something that all your singletons inherit from, which makes no sense because these are pr probably wildly different objects that have nothing to do with each other other than the fact that they happen to be using the singleton pattern. That doesn't make them related, right? A pattern is not an object relation between these things. It's simply a way of uh, creating the object, right? So instead of using vertical code reuse that normal inheritance give you, traits let you do horizontal code reuse. You can say all these objects need this same common piece of code, so we use a trait. It's a little bit like mixins in Ruby, except mixins don't handle conflict resolution very intelligently. So if you use two traits that both implement the same method, then the last one wins in, in the mixin which can be a little bit confusing because you might have two classes that both have the same set of mixins that do completely different things because the order is slightly different in one class versus the other. So order matters when you're using mixins. And I'm not a big fan of that. It's, it's too hard to figure out what's happening. So if you do have two methods that are the same in two um, traits, you're going to get a compiler error. And then you can use the conflict resolution. You can say, I want to use this method from this trait and the same method from the other trait I want to alias to some other name or I want to just ignore it, right? But again, you can read way more about traits at php.net slash traits. Another feature in 5.4, we have a short array syntax now. I don't think it's that big a deal, but okay. <laughs> It's slightly less typing, but hopefully your typing speed is not what's the limiting factor. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, then wow, man, you're, you're gods. <laughs> we also have function array dereferencing. So if a function returns an array using the fan our fancy new syntax here, right? We can now say, echo fruits, call the fruits function, and echo out the first element of the returned array in a single call, which is nice. Um, we have some other things that are along the same lines. So IMC, instant, instance method calls. This means that you can instantiate an object, call a method on it right away, and you can chain them, obviously, but you've always been able to chain them. That's not new. The new part is that you can instantiate the object and call a method right away in the same call. Now, in many cases, this probably should just be a static method call. I mean, there are times if you need the constructor and stuff, but if you're just instantiating and throwing it away on the same line, mostly it probably should just be a static method call. But there are times where it's useful. So you follow how this works, right? Instantiate, we set x to 20. This x, the public property gets set to 20, then we get it with the get that just returns it, so we get 20 back, right? We're gonna expand on that a little bit. So we can combine that with function array dereferencing, right? So now we create our new foo2, we set x to this array, 0, 10, 20, 30. We get x, but we get element two, right? Which is the third element. So 0, 1, 2, so we're going to get 20 back, right? This is starting to get a little scary, <laughs> right? If you just at a glance look at this and go, whoa, what's happening here, right? You can get a little bit crazier. So you can do instance method array dereferencing, right? So here we're creating an object. We're passing a two-dimensional array to the constructor, right? Because now with our square brackets, we can nest an array inside another array, right? And then we can pop into the inner array and get the first element, right? So inner array, first element, and we get out four. But just the fact that I had to spend like 60 seconds explaining <laughs> what this line of code does 
to me means that this shouldn't be a single line of code. There's nothing wrong with using three lines of code, just like you would in previous versions. But I'm really afraid of what some of the frameworks out there are going to do with this, because we're going to get lines of code like this, and it's going to be impossible. And you can instantiate multiple objects, obviously, within this as you pile through all these chains, and it's going to get really, really ugly, I'm afraid. But there's a lot of demand for this, especially from the framework people. So something new in 5.4 is how we handle closures and objects. So if you define a closure inside an object, so here we have class foo that has a private property called dollar $prop. Now the interesting question here is, we then define a closure. We don't call it, we simply return the closure to outside the scope of the object. Should a function that we call from outside of the scope of the object have access to a private property inside that object? Like normally it wouldn't, right? Normally you call some method somewhere, we call a function somewhere that's not being called from inside the object, shouldn't really be able to see private properties. But remember, when you define a closure, it's early binding. It's the value of dollar this at the time that you created the closure. And that dollar this has access to the private property. So in that sense, it's consistent that you do have access to it. And you're also the idiot that wrote the closure inside the class and, and leaked it out. So I mean, you probably meant to give that closure access to it, or else you wouldn't have to find it inside that object, right? So we went back and forth a little bit on this, but everyone basically said, yeah, I mean, if you define it inside the class, it has access. Yes? What if you pass in the closure as the argument? Then it wouldn't. But now, there are ways to do it, because it's the time of definition. That means you would have defined the closure outside, and outside you wouldn't have access to that scope, right? So that wouldn't work, however, you can rebind the closure as well, which means, so in this case here, I can create two versions of my foo object, right? And my foo object, all it did was, if you notice, it just uppercased, it just did a UC first on the property, right? So I do new foo is an A, uh, new foo with bar going in, B is foo pickle, func equals get printer, so I get my closure and I call it and I get bar because my closure came from the A object, right? However, I can then take my closure and I can bind it to the B object and I can call it and now I get pickle. And that starts to get a little complicated, um, but you can only bind to the same um, class and everything, so there are some rules around it, but you can do some very interesting, crazy things passing around closures and rebinding them to different types of objects. I'm sure the framework folks are going to do some really nasty things with this. You can also define a closure as static. Just like a, a static method in the function, if you try to access dollar this from a static method, you're going to get an error. Same thing here, right? So if I define my closure as being a, so here I have a public static function get printer, um, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> Bad slide, I wrote it last night. Um, here, return static function is where I should have done it. You would get an error on trying to call um, the, the closure because it's trying to access dollar this and it was defined as a static closure and that's not going to work. Yes. Yeah, so there's two levels of it, yeah, right. So, I mean, this one wouldn't have access to this, your get printer fun function wouldn't, but you could make this non-static and make it static in here, and then this wouldn't have access to this when you try to call it, yes. I had my, my static on the wrong thing there. I have to fix my slide. We've added a callable type hint. So, if a function takes a closure, you can say this one takes a, a callable. Now, people keep asking, why don't we have type hints for integers and for the scalar types? And the reason we don't have type hints for scalar types is that 
the whole point of PHP really. So the PHP built up around the fact that scalar values are interchangeable in PHP. Because the web is not typed, everything comes across in the post or a get, everything is a string, right? You put up a form that asks the person for their age, they type in 25, what you get is not an integer. There's no way in HTML to specify this form field is actually an integer. Now there is some JavaScript level validation things now that doesn't flow across HTTP. By the time PHP gets it, all it knows is that it has a string with a value in it that's 25. Now if I was to take that age and pass it to a function that had a type hint, and this, there's nothing hinting about type hints. It's the fact that if you say this takes an in integer and you pass it the string, it's not going to work. That means you always have to then cast. Before you call any lower level functions, you have to always cast all this user input. And it doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. It should be the library authors that if they really do want to restrict it, they can check the type, they can do that. But it shouldn't be encouraged to say that we want strong typing as function arguments for interchangeable types. Because there's nothing wrong with passing a string with two five in it to a function that looks at the person's age because you can take this and use mathematical operators on it. Works fine in PHP. We do perfect type juggling. So all that integer type hint would do is basically break the function. And there's no reason for that. But a callable is not an interchangeable type. If something tries to call the argument as a function and this thing is not, doesn't look like a function, it's not going to work, right? And callable does take all the various ways you can say a function in PHP, the array, like the array with the class and then the method name and all those different things can be passed in. They will all pass as callable, as you can see here. We also have a built-in web server in 5.4. This is mostly for improving our unit testing. There are a lot of cases where we try to emulate a web server from the command line because we can't rely on the user's system where they do the configure make, make test. We can't rely on them having a web server that we have access to that we can put the right files onto because there's just no way of knowing. But being able to fire up our own little web server for our testing framework is going to make a lot of these tests so much easier to write. And we're actually testing the real code. We're not testing an emulation of what is kind of sort of like a web server through weird CGI command line parameters. Right, so we can actually test the modules. We can test the real stuff with this. Please don't use it for production web serving. <laughs> Please. It's not a full web server. It's a little thing. So if you're writing an IDE, you need to be able to run code quickly. Perfect, right? Unit tests that need a little web server for running unit tests, great. But having it as your front end web server that answers public port 80, bad, bad, bad idea. Tiny feature, binary notation, just like you can do 0x for hex, you can do 0b for binary. Slightly improved error messages. It's kind of hard to spot the difference, but you'll see here I do class ABC foo. Before we just said, hey, you had an unexpected, and this is a low level token, partial token that just says, hey, unexpected token. But here it tells you which token was unexpected. And it's food that was unexpected there. This is a long time coming, but we now have a notice on array to string conversions because pretty much any time you see array pop out, you have a bug, right? Because if, if creating an array and echoing it directly is how you meant to write the string array, then you're confused, <laughs> right? There are way better ways to output the string array than to create a PHP array and try to <laughs> do it. So pretty much any time you get this, it's a bug. However, this has caused us way more pain than I thought it would with lots of existing projects out there. Um, Drupal, for example, lots of their test cases broke because of this. And there are some array comparison functions. Um, there's an array diff, for example, where you can do a, a diff on two arrays. So if you have array one, two, three, and another array uh, one, two, four, 
it'll come back and say that, well, one, two are common, but the third element is different than these twos, in these two. Now, array diff only does, does one nesting level. It doesn't go down deeper. So if it sees a nested array, it ends up, if you have one comma two comma nested array three, four, it looks to array diff like it's one comma two comma string array because it does an array to string conversion there. So they were comparing one comma two comma array to another um, array that had maybe one comma two comma a different nested array and array diff would say, yeah, they match because the string array and the string array match up and the one and two are the same, they're the same, okay? Or they could have one comma two comma string array in one array, <laughs> right? And they can have one comma two comma a nested array in the other one, right? Those are again the same thing. Obviously wrong, but their test relied on that fact because in their case, they actually had two empty nested arrays. So they were the same, but both of those empty arrays got converted to the string array and a notice popped up and the test broke. But we finally convinced them that look guys, this is a useful notice. Fix your damn tests. You are trying to do an array diff on multi-level arrays and it doesn't support multi-level arrays. Perhaps it should submit a patch, but currently it doesn't do what you expect. So I expect that we're gonna get more headaches from this particular change, but I think, still think it's a good change. I think you can catch many, many bugs out there. We have some JSON related improvements. So we have a JSON serializable interface that you can now implement. So if someone tries to JSON encode your object, if you've implemented this interface, you now have some control over what comes back in your JSON encode when they try to JSON encode your object. You have a JSON pretty printer, just JSON encode with JSON pretty print. Minor feature and a few other um, features on the JSON encode that you can pass in. Big into string and, and other things like that. Some small miscellaneous things. If you're writing PHP extensions that do direct output, we've completely changed the output API, but pretty much nobody <laughs> in this room has ever done that, but it may affect one or two. Um, session entropy, you are always able to set the session, session entropy to slash dev u random. Nobody ever did. So we've now defaulted that for all the idiots that don't realize that maybe they should add some entropy. It, we didn't do it by default because it's not completely portable. So we try to detect it at config time and stuff. But for the most part, everyone is now on Linux anyway, so it's fine. Um, we have now separated the short output syntax from short tags because it doesn't really conflict, right? You're supposed to name your PI tag the name of this PI tab happens to be equals, but that doesn't conflict with XML or, or other things out there, right? So we now have a second namespace in the PI space, right? That's just equals. So equals and PHP are both PI tags. But it means that you can use this in your templates without worrying about short tags being turned on, which is kind of useful. This one here is also gonna cause a lot of headaches. I switched the default char set to UTF-8. Now, most sane sites already do that. They already set default char set equals UTF-8 in their I and I. But many don't. Many don't specify it. And then lots and lots of sites are still running ISO 8859-1. And a lot of their stuff is now going to break. They upgrade to PHP 5.4. They don't specify their char set. They have all this data that's in 8859-1. Sorting and all kinds of things are going to be wrong for them because trying to sort 8859-1 with a UTF-8 based sorter, for, for normal low ASCII stuff, that's no problem. But once you have any sort of accents or anything, the sorter order is gonna be wrong. So there's gonna be a billion bug reports on this particular one. And we've been a little bit gun shy about changing this, but I think we need to move the world to UTF-8, right? We can't keep living in our own little world here, right? And around multibyte, there's actually a lot of multibyte related stuff in 5.4. Um, the MB string stuff, to get the overloading and some of the really low level MB string support, you used to have to build, or you used to have to build PHP specifically with multibyte support turned on. Um, you can now configure this at runtime with an INI setting, which helps a lot. 
We have much better support for Asian characters um, in various functions, specifically special chars and entities. Um, a couple other internal functions as well handle Asian character sets much better now. There's a way to completely turn off post data processing with an INI directive. If for some reason you want to process it yourself. Um, there was a security, well, not quite. There's sort of a design issue in XSLT where you can write into XSLT um, templates and you can write to the output via an XSLT write. So it's now possible if you're taking untrusted XSLT from someone or untrusted templates, you can now specify that XSLT is not going to do any sort of writes from any write commands in them. And that is that is a little bit useful to people who, who do that. Um, AES support in OpenSSL. Debug backtrace, this is one that has hit me many times. When you call debug backtrace, you get this mondo thing. If you're deep inside a bunch of object calls and things, you get way too much output. Now you can specify how many levels, so you don't have to do your own array mangling to do that. We're using MySQL ND as our default uh, MySQL client library now. MySQL ND is a very nice library that's built specifically for PHP. It uses the PHP memory manager internally. So memory limit and all these things apply to your low level MySQL calls. And it does things quite a bit more efficiently than calling into a non PHP aware MySQL client library. Um, you can do some very cool stuff. You can do asynchronous SQL queries. You can do this in 5.3 as well. This isn't new to 5.4. It's the new thing is just that we default to, to MySQL ND. But with the asynchronous MySQL queries and some of the other fancy things you can do with it, you can do some interesting stuff. Um, file upload from the session extension, not a big deal. Now, this might break some stuff as well, but we have given up on the TZ environment variable. There's just way too many problems trying to figure out the right time zone um, across. So, Having a portable application that works across multiple versions of even Linux, where the TC database changes from one to the other, it's pretty much impossible if you relied on the TC environment var. So at this point, we have just killed it. Unless you specify a time zone, we're now UTC by default. Now again, just like UTF-8, web apps these days really should be UTF-8 and UTC. Right? It's the only sane choice for building any sort of thing that's bigger than your own little world here in one state in the United States, right? If you need to cover multiple time zones, multiple languages, UTF-8 with UTC, convert this stuff on output, but internally store it in a single unified um, non-time zone timestamp. PHP minus A is the command line version of PHP, right? Now it has full read line support, which is kind of cool. We've added E strict to E all, so you better start fixing your E strict. Because <laughs> if you only had E all before in 5.3, you wouldn't see the E strict. You're going to see them in 5.4. And if you follow along crypto stuff, you'll know Blowfish had some issues. So there are some new uh, Blowfish hashes now. And these are supported in 5.4. And you can also now use sort natural and sort flag case in all the sort functions. So we had a natural sort ability. We had to call the natural sort specifically. But now all of the sort functions, all the array sort functions can take sort natural by default. So finally, before we get into what will probably be a very lively Q&A, um, I would like to encourage you guys to contribute. And by you guys, also your companies, your friends, your neighbors, whatever. You don't have to be super technical to help us out a bit. PHP runs a lot of the web out there. And we see a lot of people complaining about things or a bug that doesn't get fixed in time or lots of things out there. There are a lot of people giving us input, not necessarily super constructive input. And it doesn't help us that much. I'd like to encourage you guys to help us out first with 5.4, if you're interested in 5.4, please, please, please test the release candidates. We have a site, qa.php.net, that you can go to that'll have RCs um, for the various versions. You'll see the PHP 5.4 RC6 is here. 
Now you can download the tarball, compile, install it. You will see um, results um, of the tests. So people, you can, if you find a, a bug or if you find a test that fails, you can submit a bug report. You can also, uh, here we go. You can see if that same test has failed for other people. So here we see the various versions people have been testing and you can dive into that. So if you're testing PHP 5.4 release candidate six, okay, these don't exist yet. They're still devs, but RC six, this one. It gives you a nice overview down here of um, the most problematic test case is apparently this one, bug 60761, where we had um, 47 failures. 46 variations meant that it failed 46 different ways, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. And the last reported date, you can dig into it and you can see how it failed for other people. So obviously this is a terrible test case where every, for everyone it fails in different ways. And it could be as simple as them having hard coded a value that is actually like a process ID or something that changes for everybody. So just a bug in the test case. So a lot of these things aren't super difficult to figure out. It's just a matter of having a look at it. And we just don't have enough people to go through all these things. So test, help us track down failed tests when you get some test failures. File some constructive bug reports, please. Pretty please, don't just yell at us. Give us some information about your system, why you think the thing is not working right, how you think it should be working. Um, we try to help you out when you report the bug. We have sections we have to fill in. Okay, what were you trying to do? What was your expected output? What was your actual output? Um, we try to guide you. Don't just swear at us in the one box and do nothing else. That doesn't help us. Um, help us process bug reports. You can help us out a lot if you go to bugs.php.net. There are some shortcut links down here. So most recent open bugs, for example. We'll sort it for the most recent first. You can start scrolling through, and if there's some, something in here that you think you know a little bit about. So here's somebody complaining about iMagic on 5.3.9 on Ubuntu. All right, you can go in and see what do you think the problem is. They, uh, they got a seg fault, it looks like. And nobody has commented on this yet. So this, even if all you do is say, well, I'm using uh, image magic, I'm using Ubuntu, let me try the same test case. If all you do is say, hey, this sec faults for me as well, that's a very useful data point that can help us out. Or if you come back and say, hey, this works fine on my system, my system looks like this, that's another data point that can help us fix that bug. And it doesn't take you very much time to do something like that. <coughs> um, you can help us write tests. So we have a site called GCOV, which is our code coverage site, where you can go in and look at the state of code coverage in PHP 5.4, for example. So we can pick something that you might be interested in, like maybe the curl, for example. We're only at 83% here, or do one of the yellows maybe and help us out. We have a couple of reds, but that's because nobody uses ODBC anymore. <laughs> Um, PDO DB lib is another thing that just nobody cares about. Sybase CT. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there are some fringes in here, but there are also some things that get used quite a bit that could use some help. So the IMAP extension, right? We're only at 64% code coverage. So here you can go in, you can click on the file, and just by the coloring, you can see blue is good, reddish is bad, so we don't have a test case that hits this particular case. Um, something about an IMAP alert something or other, who knows what that is, but it would help us if you can go through, if you're, you can read the code a little bit and you can construct a test case that actually exercises that part of the code, that would be helpful. Um, if you're not much of a coder, you can't read code and test code. Maybe you can help us with the documentation. We have written a really kick-ass docbook XML tool. You can, log in as, you can log in anonymously. 
And what you get when you come in is this very nice in-browser tool that lets you basically browse all the documentation, browse the docbook XML that's in there, and you can edit anything. And with a single button, you can submit that change to us. And it comes in as a patch, basically, on the mailing list. And every day, or at least a couple of times a week, people go through all these contributed documentation things and approve them. And it ends up in the documentation eventually. This is a little bit more useful to us than the user notes. The user notes in the documentation are great. But somebody needs to take those user notes, convert them to Docbook with XML, and write them a little bit more formally and bring them into the documentation. So even if that's all you do, you go through user notes and find the best notes, say, hey, this example would be useful in documentation. Go in here, and you'll also find that on the, in the manual, uh, I don't have my toolbar. If you go to php.net slash stringling, for example, you'll find on this page there's an edit link up here. That edit link will take you to the right place in the docbook editor, bring you up right to the page with the docbook XML, and you can go in and you can start editing, you can say save, and that'll submit the patch directly to us that we can do sort of a one-click, bring it in. Um, so we tried to build lots and lots of cool tools that makes it easy for you guys to do this. So give us a hand, please. And what else? Um, we have a wiki, if you're interested in seeing how features come about in PHP. We have a wiki where you can su submit RFCs. So there's various things in there. One of them is the RFC request for comments, the first one here. We can see the various ones. So a whole bunch of things under discussion, drafts of various things. Um, somebody wants auto boxing, for example. So they have some examples on auto boxing, how it would work. Some results of discussions, conflicts, what might break, how to possibly fix those breaks, how it relates to existing extensions, other things like that. Um, and this isn't done by one person. One person will kick it off, then others will go in and edit and say, well, this won't work because of this. And then the author will come back and say, well, here's a possible fix for that issue. And eventually, we go through this and we, we get a feature added. Traits took about three years <laughs> through this process, which, because it's pretty big and complicated. Um, some other features take two months and they get in. All right. And that's my conclusion. Get on 5.3, help us test 5.4, please, and contribute some stuff back to us. It's not that hard. Let's have some questions. I'm sure you have many. <laughs> Go, questions. Yes, Shalom. Oh, we have a mic, okay. Um. A great talk today, thank you. I'm, I'm actually a, a Python and Django developer. That's okay. And <laughs> <laughs> but you know, every, every language has its uh, idiosyncrasies. Python, everyone has a really hard time with the um, the indentation thing, and that comes, you know, it's, it's from the beginning. And I've always wondered about the the dollar sign variables in PHP, where that came from. So the dollar sign variables is for string uh, interpolation. If you're inside a string and you want to put a variable, unless you have some kind of delimiter, how the hell do you do, uh, say, echo, hello, first name, how are you? Right? So either you have to put weird stuff around it, or you put a single dollar sign in there. It makes it really, really easy. So in that sense, and also because people are kind of used to it from Perl, and a lot of people came from Perl CGI to PHP in the early days, and it was a very, very natural thing. But it did make the parsing of the language easier. So when you're writing, my first parser was a state machine based parser that was sort of all in my head. I didn't use any tools. It was much, much easier to be able to see, hey, OK, dollar sign, here comes a variable. So those two reasons, string interpolation, because the web is string based. Strings are a very important thing for web based applications. And the fact that it made the parser easier to write. So I hear a lot 
or sometimes from like either clients or people that you know in, in my agency who are more client facing that like they're a little cautious about building stuff in PHP because they have this kind of vague sense that it's just for little websites and right because scale. there are no big websites yeah in PHP. yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> I guess the qu my, that doesn't make any sense. I know it doesn't make sense, but like, how, like how how do you like how would you respond to that the critique? Like, like if that. you're like, oh, Yahoo, Wikipedia, Facebook, Etsy. Etsy? Yeah. Oh, sorry, 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 Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I mean, well, how can you respond to it? All you can do is say, hey, other people have managed to do it, right? And a big website like that is hard in every language. There is no language out there where you sort of just whip up an Etsy or a Yahoo or a Facebook in a weekend, right? And it's so much more than the front end language like PHP. Every large site in the world ends up using a dozen different technologies, hundreds of technologies for some of them, right? So it's a matter of putting all these pieces together. And PHP is very, very rarely the problem in something like that. It's usually the, the entire architecture itself and how all the pieces fit together, how you scale them, how you deploy all this stuff. There are so many bigger problems than that piece of the technology. And if, you're, if they don't, want to use PHP, then they shouldn't use PHP. But it depends on what experience they have and what kind of developers they can hire. If they really want to use Haskell, but nobody knows Haskell in the company, it well, doesn't help them, right? If the engineers, they have no PHP, use PHP. If they know Python, use Python. But another thing, I've, so I've done a little bit of um, helping out some VCs a little bit and doing some uh, analysis of VC pitches for them or some technical due diligence on them. And the one scary thing I've heard sometimes is when the first thing they talk about is like, our site is in Python. It's like, okay, but what does it do? It's in Python. It's not important. And the VCs certainly don't care which technology you use. The users couldn't care less how you're sending them the bytes, right? I wanna buy my green shoes on Etsy. I wanna hit the buy button. I want them to show up at my door. That's what I care about. Whether it's Python, Ruby, PHP, Perl that's getting my green shores, shoes to my door, who cares, right? Solve the problem, and that's what it's about. People worry way too much about technology, I think. There, okay. Um, so uh, where I have to say we're really happy with the changes we're seeing in 5.4, okay. just like seriously ecstatic. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, both with 5.3 and 5.4, what I've noticed is that um, a lot of the improvements seem to, one, um, reflect things that I, I've seen discussed on the bug track or on the wiki for years prior to that, and usually met with responses from the core team of, no, screw you, this is stupid. Uh, no, and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, we're geeks. We're not the most socially adapted people in the world, right? Uh -huh. And usually what comes across as a no, screw you is a, no, this won't work because it breaks this, right? And traits was in that state for quite a long time. There was a lot of things. The very first traits implementation, mm -hmm. if we had put that in right away, mm -hmm. it would have been a disaster, right? So, and as PHP has grown, it has become harder and harder to make large changes, right? In the early days, I would go in and I would completely change the language from one night to the next because I had SSH accounts on most of the machines in the world that used it. <laughs> so I could log in to I all the back doors in the. No, but this was a, it was a different internet back then, right? Everyone knew each other, right? <laughs> it was very strange. I I knew all the people that used PHP at one point, and it was only like 140 or so people on the mailing list, and they all used PHP. And I had logins on most of the machines. If I made a change, I'd change PHP, I'd deploy it to their site, and I'd change their code, right? <laughs> so I I could make drastic changes overnight. We can't do that anymore. We make one little change. We add one little notice to one little thing, and things blow up everywhere. You do something as big as traits that fundamentally changes the object model. Yeah, it took us three years. And even then, we're going to have issues that we didn't know about. I mean, even though we've had lots of RC candidates, people have been talking about traits for a year, 
watch, when PHP 5.4 comes out, we're gonna get a barrage of people saying, well, trades are completely broken because blah. And they don't come out before we release, obviously. They don't test the release candidates. There's just all these things. So we try to think of everything on the large changes like that. And it takes some time, especially because there's only like a handful of us that's actually doing work on any one particular feature. I would love to see more people involved so we can move a little bit faster. But sometimes a feature gets stuck for six months because the guy is having a baby, right? And he's, he's distracted. So, and that's just, life happens. And when you're a small team, you can't do much about it. And it's kind of weird that it is a handful of people that is building PHP and PHP runs so much of the web and there's so much money flowing through PHP and all these companies that rely on it seriously are stuck because some guy in Estonia, his wife is having a baby. Sorry, <laughs> the web is on hold for six months. Uh, uh, syntactically speaking, in particular, that um, 5.4 is converging very strongly on CMA, ECMA scripts, three or thereabouts, and it's, it's a welcome direction. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, I work over at Vimeo. We're also a PHP shop. Okay, so that's cool. You can add that to your list. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty but, big one too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just actually got uh, this one, the Sarah Goldman okay. book yeah. uh, today. It's a little uh, outdated, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, um, I was actually curious if you you would suggest some resources for digging in deeper, um, looking to get more involved with uh, extensions. Okay. Extensions, understanding the source, and, and being able to dissect what's actually taking place yeah. on the site. Y your best bet is really the source code itself. Like every feature in PHP is written against that same extension API. So you take any PHP function. So if you're trying to write a new extension that takes an array, a string, and an object, for example, you look around PHP, you find a function that takes sort of the same arguments and does similar things, copy paste clone that and then poke around in the source code. We don't have an up-to-date definitive API spec because there's only the same handful of people that's capable of writing it and that same group of people hate writing documentation, <laughs> right? Nice. Okay. Sarah got swallowed up by Facebook yeah. a few years ago and she hasn't emerged for a long time. So that we, we keep losing some of our best folks that get swallowed up by big companies that kind of hide them yeah. for whatever reason. Is, is the mailing list a good place to go when you hit a wall? Or, mm -hmm. or? Um, probably the Peckle Dev list when you're writing extensions. Internals has lots of crackpots on it, but Peckle Dev <laughs> is quieter and has, has a saner subset of, of people on there. Um, well, internals, people always say, they put, well, I posted to internals and someone called me an idiot. <laughs> Usually the person that called you an idiot has never committed to PHP in their lives, but we're, we're an open source project. Everything about what we do is open. Every commit is open. All the discussions we have are open. Everything is out in the open. Anybody can join and voice their opinion, which is great, but it also sucks because everybody in the world can come and voice their opinion, and it's hard to in any way police that and say, well, please don't call people with intelligent questions idiots because they miss some little aspect of it. And Sometimes the PHP project gets labeled as, as calling people idiots, like we heard already. You have to look a little bit about who was it actually. Like somebody on the internet called you an idiot is essentially what it boils down to. It tends to happen. <laughs> right? totally, totally. It doesn't necessarily mean that officially the PHP project called you an idiot because somebody happened to do that on that mailing list. Right? Right. So, so to avoid some of that, the Peckle dev list okay. is probably a better spot. For, cool. for those type of questions. Hey, one more quick question. Um, I, with the uh, introduction of some of the new data structures in the SPL, do you, do you guys have plans for any more or is that? Uh, yeah, is that I mean, the SPL is a nice place to put these data structures where it doesn't confuse new users because you kind of have to go looking for them. Um, and, and yeah, if you, if you have some interesting suggestions for new data structures for SPL, write up a little RFC. It, it's small enough that it wouldn't take very long to get through. Um, yeah, we're very open to new ones there. Hey, so one of the areas that I think PHP has always been a little bit weak and sort of lags behind uh, the other popular web languages, Ruby and Python, is uh, dependency management, especially third-party dependencies and environments. Like, there's no virtual env, there's no RVM for PHP. That's the standard way to do that sort of thing. 
Yeah, um, I mean, we, we do have our pair and Peckle ins installers. There's, there's pair and Peckle, and that matches up with PIP and GEM, but there's nothing right. like virtual Enver RVM. Yeah, um, that's And true. so it's harder to, most things are installed system-wide, and it's harder to do, you know, multiple isolated dev environments. And I'm just curious if that's by design, by not... It's not really it's by design. It's more a, nobody has come up with a good way of doing it that kind of meshes with the PHP approach, hmm. right? I would love to see a good suggestion on, on how, to go, how to do it, but it's one of these kind of religious things as well where everyone has a different idea of how it should be done, and it's hard to reach any sort of consensus on something like that, but if you have the magic bullet on that one, I'd love to see it. Um, back to the subject of uh, idiots. Um, you said something at the beginning about um, if um, you, ha you have to be an idiot to use a non-strongly typed language, and I'm not <laughs> sure if I heard that correctly, or were you being yeah. sarcastic or serious, <laughs> well, or both, or maybe you can so just that, that was, expand. So when I said that you have to be an idiot to use a non-strong typed language for a large web application, that was, that was my thinking when I started PHP in 1994, right? I wrote all my heavy lifting in C at that time. The C++ compilers weren't quite there yet. So I wrote my apps in C, and I basically exposed my, my, C app, my C functions to the templates via this tagging system. So what I thought I was giving to people, what I was open sourcing, was this mechanism for creating new tags in HTML, essentially. Kind of wrapped in some comments and stuff, but still having a very easy way of putting a little macro tag into a template and linking that to a C function without needing to know the HTTP, the, the web server API, and all the HTTP stuff, the output layer. So I would hide that behind an easy to use API so you could very, very easily extend web servers in C. That was PHP in my view. Now, I tried for like two, three years to convince people, look how easy it is to add a tag. And someone would say, well, I need a tag that talks to DBM. I need a way to just get a record from a DBM database. I say, well, just link in libdb, and then here you go. Here's a little thing. I say, well, thank you. Now I need a tag that does this. And eventually, in order to try to explain to people how easy it was to add tags, I wrote extensions for tons of websites out there. I wrote basically all their websites for them. So I say, look how easy it is. And they say, thank you. Now we need this, <laughs> right? And people who came to PHP would look at all the example tags and they would just use them and say, hey, that has most of the things we need, but we're missing a few. So it turned from being this, this framework for extending the web server into a collection of, of useful tags that you could embed in your templates. And that's what people wanted. They didn't want to write code. They want to just stick a couple of tags in their HTML and have it do magic, right? And that's when things started getting more complicated because then you need some conditional logic in these templates. Just having tags with no logic around it is very restrictive. You need to be able to say, well, if this tag returns this value, then do this, otherwise do that. And then once you start having conditional logic in the templating language, it's downhill from there, right? There's no way to stop. Because once you've added if else, right? Well, why wouldn't you have switch case? It's almost the same thing, right? <laughs> and once you have little blocks of code inside this a case, why, why wouldn't you have a function call? Why wouldn't you be able to, if all your cases are calling the same three lines of code, why not wrap that in a function call? If you have a function call, well, why shouldn't you be able to recursively call yourself from it? Why not? I mean, you can call that function from here. Why can't you call it from here? But once you have recursive function calls, now you suddenly need some kind of static scope in the function, right? Because it, recursion without static scope is infinite recursion, which was the first version of recursion when people asked me for it. I implemented recursion, but there was no way to exit. <laughs> so people said, do you support recursion? Yes. <laughs> but it's infinite, <laughs> always. <laughs> so but it's such a slippery slope once you start adding that stuff. And that's, that's where that's sort of where things started to change and it's like, okay, fine. Yes, it's, it's idiotic to, com to program large applications in a loosely typed parsed language, but the web is moving way too fast. You can't spend 18 months developing a very nice solid C application because by the time you've done that, your competitor who did it in two months has the entire market. Right, so that's when I went from sort of okay, slow and, and, and slow and, and, and careful to let's just go as fast as humanly possible because the web is moving way too fast, 
And the way web developers were created in the, in the mid 90s was basically companies said, hey, we need to get on the web. They look around the company, well, we don't have a web team. We do have a documentation team. Let's put our documentation online, right? And the documentation team says, okay, Microsoft Word, save as HTML, FTP it to our website. Great. Now the documentation's online. It looks okay. It looks a little weird because of words, HTML support, but whatever. It, it's online. We created a website. Management says, cool, nice website. Let's hook up our product database, right? Let's hook up our inventory database. And this poor documentation team that has been turned into the web team said, uh, Microsoft Word, connect to Oracle? Mm, that doesn't work, right? How do we do that? And they basically, they wanted the connect to Oracle tag. And that's when they came to PHP and said, I just want to add a magic tag. I don't know this C stuff. This is complicated. But I want a magic tag that can check our product inventory in an Oracle database. And I just want to put one tag in my Microsoft Word generated HTML output. Um, and that's essentially what PHP became for them. They became copy and paste from the PHP documentation directly into this crappy HTML they generated. They don't know jack shit about programming. But that was the web. That's how the web was built. Right? That's why it grew so fast, because everybody out there could put their stuff online. And PHP enabled them to do it a little bit better than just simply static documentation. They were able to do more dynamic stuff quicker than through other technologies. And that's it's just the way it grew. I still think it's kind of nuts. But the web, it's, it's the Wild West, right? I mean, we're moving so fast. The web, just compared to three years ago, is a completely different place. We don't have time to go slow. We really don't. Fail fast, fail cheap. I keep telling people. I've been saying that for 15 years now. I mean, you, you have to fail. You fail all the time. And if it takes you three years to fail, you're dead. You don't get another shot. If it takes you a month to fail, you can try many, many times until you hit the right angle at something. I had a question about the, the hash gossip. Or the hash hash gossip. OK, my favorite topic. Okay. Um, why does the, uh, when, it, when a collision happens, why is the value lead to a linked list and not a salted set of another bucket, like a, another set of buckets? Another set of buckets. But you still have to get to that other set of buckets. Uh, but when you get inside that, inside that set, couldn't you salt that set? So well, you, you use know there's no collision so you inside of it? You, you salt the things would be different. Yeah, exactly. you could. But then you have to rehash at that point as well. Yeah. And that, that was, you would still have a hash dosh in, in the sense that if you ha keep hashing to the same thing, you, the, the thousandth collision is going to have to hash a thousand times to find its bucket. Right. If you think about it, you're going to have to hash, hash, hash. hash. So a single, a single array insert will have to call the hash function a thousand times. That's not any faster yeah. than hopping through, going through it's like a thousand linked links. Sure. So uh, there's really no good answer to that one other than randomizing the, the hash random, so that you, people can't pre-compute it. That's kind of what I was thinking. If you stored a uh, randomized salt alongside this set of buckets. Sure, sure, but if you have a randomized salt, you don't need to do this because then people right. can't pre-compute it. And you could have just put the randomized salt on the first one. Right? Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like You can just randomize from the beginning. And that's, that's yeah. one solution to this. The problem with us doing that, at least in PHP 5.3, is that opcode caches and others actually have things stored on disk with the computed hashes gotcha. already. So if you then change it, you, the next request has a different randomized hash. Yeah. It can't understand these saved Because it tables. wouldn't know how to pull it back. So you'd have right. to store so it would, that hash it would be a binary. It. it would be a binary break, basically. And we always promise people within a yeah. 5.x.y, within the .ys, there are no binary breaks. You don't have to recompile extensions. Everything should just work when you upgrade. And if you decided to store that hash alongside it, then the problem would be when it comes back out, you have the same DOS approach that somebody might know that the salt yeah. Yeah. that was yeah. stored. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you. More questions? I see one. I'm a, I'm a little confused by your uh, explanation for function hint, uh, function hints uh, okay. for scalar types. Right. Strong and typing, basically, yeah. So I don't see the harm in, if I don't put anything, I allow anything. Right. But if I put a scalar type, like an int, mm -hmm. 
Why then, then you can only allow ints? And gen usually there's no reason to only allow ints. I mean, you can do that today, right? You can I could, I could, yeah. You can check the type in your function and say, well, I actually need an int here, fail. That should be uh, the exception rather than the norm. You should never really do that. There's, why would you force them to cast this to an integer before you pass it in? Why can't you pass them a string with uh, an integer in it? Because I, well, I, like, I write a lot of utility classes that okay. only work on scalar types. Why would they only work on the scalar type? So what operation are you doing inside there that breaks if you get So I'm going to write my own add class with a function. OK. Or add function. Right. So when you use plus, you, yeah. should, you probably use plus to add it. If you yeah. add two strings with a plus, you get an integer back out. Right? That's right. why we have a differentiation between the string concat and a mathematical operator. You can add two strings with a mathematical operator. It'll do the type Still juggling, and you'll the get string. the right thing. Right? So from that particular case, if you hinted it to be an int, yeah. you would break all your callers because the callers are oh fuck, this thing only takes an integer. Now I have to cast it. Why do I have to cast it? It worked perfectly before, but now this guy added a stupid type hint, so now I suddenly have to, everywhere I call it, I have to add an extra cast. And that shouldn't be the caller's responsibility. Especially because your function works perfectly without that restriction. But it, it's really hard to write a piece of code that will not work unless you pass it an int. What about storing data stores? You're storing into MongoDB, for example. Into which? You're storing into MongoDB, which is a type data store. Okay. And uh, then it gets really confusing because the driver is not MongoDB. Right, but MongoDB has access functions that actually does force the type, right? Yeah. No, I, I'm not saying there aren't cases, but it's so, so easy for you to cast that in your access function. You shouldn't, your caller shouldn't have to worry about that, right? You know that I need to store this thing as a key. So you can do this numeric check. Say, hey, you pass me a string, that's fine. It has a number, it's a numeric string, that's fine. I'm going to cast it to an int and I'm going to store this thing in Mongo. The caller shouldn't be on the hook for that. The caller shouldn't be forced to do it because he'll probably get it wrong, right? You know what type needs to be stored. That shouldn't need to push up, be pushed upstream. Then why allow any hints? Because there are some types that are not interchangeable, right? If something tries to use a MySQL object to talk to a MySQL database and you pass it a file pointer, that's never going to work, right? You try to call a method on the MySQL object to insert, to do a query, right? And you call file pointer query, no chance. Right? right. Non-interchangeable types we have type hints for. But I just feel like I'm not going to pass the string value of a, a number just as likely as I would pass the integer value. I feel like I would, like, someone sure, calling my function would just completely mess up the types well, altogether if they're going to make that mistake. I doubt it. I mean, everything is a string originally in, on the, in the web, we're a web application language, right? Everything is a string. Right, but some of us don't take values from HTML forms and then... Okay, and that's fine. They'll still yeah. work, right? If they pass you the right type, great. Right. If they pass you the wrong type that happens to still be compatible, okay. And if you really care, I mean, there are cases, like the Mongo case, there are cases where you do need to care. But writing that code, it's not like you can't do it today. You can do it easily. It's just the exception. It's not the norm. The normal case, because if we had that type int, everyone would say, hey, my add function takes two ints, int, int, right? right? For no reason whatsoever. It does not improve the quality of the application in that case. It feels it, also self-documenting, self though. Like, yeah, but you can do that already with PHP doc. There's all kinds of ways where you can do that hinting, right? To, to do the documentation yeah. uh, on that. That doesn't need to be, if your only reason for strong typing is that it makes documentation easier? Oh. It's just one, one <laughs> thing, but yeah. What about the case when somebody messes up the order of arguments and passes a string and a number and the string gets coerced into zero or something? And, okay. and uh, then does not get well, a compiled type error and it, instead gets some unexpected, undefined result at runtime? Sure, but if, if they pass it's just kind of the basic argument, right, in these cases. Sure, but if they pass it in the wrong order, it's not going to work anyway, right? Well, right, so. but they're going to get a compiled type error if it's, if it's a string going in. Yeah. Yeah. 
I still don't buy it. <laughs> Write your own language. <laughs> Seems like a great comment to close on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rasmus. You're welcome.